Welcome to the Startup Grind. Okay, welcome everyone. And uh, as you heard from Dee, uh, th this is the first of our beach clubs, but we also have a, a resort here, which is an entrepreneur resort. So we run um, accelerators from that, and that's out on the East Coast uh, next to the Safari Park. And so we have people from all around the world that come in and uh, learn about entrepreneurship. And we have had that for now five years, but we have seen the entrepreneur community here grow. Uh, co-working spots start up, uh, including obviously this one and one which was here in Sonora before we were, which is Kumpul. And that is the one that Faye co-founded. So we're going to hear uh, a lot more than just about co-working. We're going to hear about entrepreneurship in Indonesia. Uh, Faye is part of a, uh, in fact, heading uh, a large group which is creating something uh, across 10 of the biggest cities in Indonesia. Uh, and it is called uh, 1000 Digital Startups or 1000 Startup Digital. And she uh, is the one who's driving it all here in Dampasa or in Bali. A and she also has set up something which just came, got going last August, which is Coworking Indonesia, which now has over 60 uh, different co-working sites in Indonesia, all part of this uh, association as well. Uh, plus, there's a whole bunch of other things she's doing as well. She keeps very busy. Uh, and she has given her time up on International Women's Day to be here. So can you please give Faye a huge round of applause? And Faye Alund, could you please come and join us? Hi, grab a seat, and this is, check it's working, see where yeah. we're going. Test, okay, All right. hi everybody. So just so everyone knows, uh, this is a series that we uh, run here in Bali, which is part of uh, Google for Entrepreneurs. So uh, Google for Entrepreneurs uh, are sponsoring an organization which is called Startup Grind. Startup Grind has 200 different meetups in 200 different cities around the world. Uh, we run the one here in Bali, and we're always looking for uh, an uh, inspiration and also at the same time new stories that can inspire any entrepreneur, whether it's in tech, whether it's in other areas. Faye's gonna do that with us tonight as we have a conversation with her. I'll be asking her some questions, but you get to ask questions a little bit later as well. And whatever questions you like, we'll see where it goes. So Faye, tell us a little bit about your journey that led you to all the things that you're doing today. Okay, um, <clears throat> so I we started Kumpul. I started Kumpul with Dennis, who is my husband. So, co-founders with in Kumpul and co-founders in life. <laughs> Bef yeah, before we started Kumpul, we actually met in Zimbabwe. So in Zimbabwe. Yeah. Um, so Dennis is from Sweden, and actually I spent around maybe 12 years before Kumpul working in development and humanitarian work. So with um, Doctors Without Borders. So I traveled around in Indonesia and then worked in um, Pakistan, Zimbabwe, and then Yemen before we moved to Bali. Yeah, um, and just before, and then why Bali? Because Yemen was in war, <laughs> so we got evacuated. <laughs> Uh, I was pregnant with our uh, with with our first daughter at that time, so they said like, "Oh, you have to go home." Um, so I was like pregnant, unemployed, you know, looking for work. And being uh, originally, I come from Jakarta, and being Jakartan, you you have this mindset that the universe is around Jakarta only. So I started applying for jobs, and then I got one. And then they said, "Oh, can you come for interview in Denpasar?" I was like, "What? Denpasar? It's not in Jakarta." So this is like a, an organization working for volunteering projects. Um, and then most of the projects were in Flores, and that's why the office was in Bali. So I was heading the, the active citizenship program. They wanted to start introducing volunteering as part of this active, active citizenship for Indonesians, because volunteering is not that sexy for Indonesian, you know? Um, we don't really see the value, why? Why I have to work for free? <laughs> of course, you can be active citizens in many ways, and because but because the the niche was volunteering programs, and so we we worked through that. Um, how, how long ago was that? Where, when it was by? between 2011. No, yeah, 2011 until 2014. So. Around that time, I think UK had a bit of monetary crisis, economic crisis, and they had to close several countries. Indonesia was one of them because they thought Indonesia is not a poor country anymore. We are actually considered as middle income countries. Um, um, and the government, uh, civil societies, uh, enough you know, 
companies, uh, private institutions, we have enough resources to take care of our problem. So they left. <laughs> <laughs> they left as in the organization they left, like that was this organization you. left. This is like and a UK based here. organization. Actually. So they're gone, you're here. They're and gone, I'm here, and I was like, okay, am I gonna find a, just another job, you know? Um, am I gonna go back to Jakarta? Maybe not, because Bali is home. Uh, we got two daughters, and then, you know, both of them were born in Bali. We have our friends here, we have the network here. So we've been wanting to set up something since we met in Zimbabwe, you know, because we met in Zimbabwe, we got back to Jakarta, we worked in Jakarta for like a bit, and we always have this need to be connected to other professionals. It's easy to, to, to find friends because you can always find, even in, in, I don't know, restaurants, you go to a beach club, uh, wherever, you know, you, you meet someone, you talk to them, you meet up again, then, then they become your friends, but it's a bit difficult to be connected on professional level and to collaborate with people. So it started with a dream, say like, oh, it would be cool to have a space that's this, 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 and this, you know? Um, so when I lost my job, it's actually a blessing in disguise. Because then we thought like, okay, so maybe this is the time to realize this, this dream. So then we set up Kumpul in Sanur. So, okay, so it, you almost became an entrepreneur by default, in a way. I mean, yeah, I didn't go to school yeah. for that. Yeah. No, I, none of us went to school for <laughs> That's the problem. But right? <laughs> I think in a lot of universities now you have this entrepreneur yeah. uh, subject, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. But it is interesting how many people are in a job thinking one day I'll be an entrepreneur and then finally they lose a job and it's like, ah, oh, now's the time. Ted Turner has this uh, quote, which is, My son is unemployed. I think today they call that an entrepreneur. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, there's, so, you, so you actually then actually set up Kumpo at that point to help people just like yourself who are like, okay, I want to have a place to get connected. But today you're doing a, a lot more than that. So how did you, how did that lead you into what you're doing now with, you know, uh, the whole uh, Google Business Group and what you're doing at the moment with a thousand uh, digital startups and, and even the, co you know, the whole co-working Indonesia. Like they're all, each one of them is a full-time job almost, mm. but you got into all of those things. So like I said, my background was really in community development because then I was working with all these, you know, projects with f values or whatever. Um, so <laughs> whatever, because I don't also believe in many of the NGOs projects, you know. So, but then some, some of us try to do good with the projects. Um, so in 2010, when at that time I think I was working with British Council, and they had this seminar about entrepreneurship in Indonesia, and they said. Um, a country, a developed country, actually needs to have a high level of entrepreneurs. So Singapore has seven to eight percent at the time, and US has fourteen point five at the time. And guess how? What's the percentage for Indonesia? Zero point eight. So the government was panicking, and it's like we have to push it, you know. And then now, you want to guess now? Today? Yeah. I would, I would have actually thought it's like 5 or 10%. It's 1.1. Really? <laughs> it's an increase. So some said it's 2, some is, is said that, it's 1.1. Is that based on, based on the number of companies set up? Uh, as opposed Probably. To, yeah, more like Probably. But if you say, oh, you know, Indonesia, Indonesians actually are very creative in, in running businesses. You see all these street vendors, you see, you know, like the tukang sate and all. Um, they are entrepreneurs, no? They Are they? I think they are self-employed. They don't have plan B. If they are sick, they are finished. They don't necessarily employ other people, so they don't really open job opportunities. Um, so they take care of themselves. And the biggest um, question is that, are they paying tax? So in terms of economic development of a country, you can't really count it as entrepreneurs because I think entrepreneurs ha needs to have, you know, plan B, plan C, plan D. You are able to scale up. Um, you are solving a problem. 
and you're giving this economic uh, the contribution to economic development through opening job opportunities, through paying tax, and such. Um, okay. uh, I, I want to jump into that a little bit more, right? I, I, I want to talk more about your story, but you've kind of hit on a really interesting dilemma, which is to what extent can governments help entrepreneurship? Uh, especially because the government's definition of an entrepreneur is one that pays tax, yes. which will probably, you know, pre, you know, delete a lot of the people sitting here who have found ways to become a global digital nomad and manage their own tax and so on. Um, plus, that is creating employment, where a lot of the smartest entrepreneurs actually are working, you know, with basically um, either automation or or working with uh, you know other outsourced um, partners and aren't actually wanting to have a whole team. So you've got this challenge where the government's got an agenda, which is like, we've got to make sure we're getting tax, we've got to make sure we're actually getting a, uh, uh, an, an, an employment count, a job count out of this. Um, so they've got their agenda. You've got the entrepreneurs themselves who are doing their thing. Um, so rather than saying, is it right or wrong, if you were, like now that you've seen what's happening in Indonesia, if you were to have a guess as to what extent you believe the entrepreneurial growth in Indonesia will come as a result of what the government does, or to what extent it will happen as a result of the actual entrepreneurial community and individuals. What's your thought around that? I think if it's only from the government initiative, it, it will not work. That's why it's still 1.1%. And even that, you know, you, you can question that number two because of the definition of entrepreneurs, right? But um, if you just also the, the just, we have 260 million people, let it sink. My husband comes from Sweden. The whole country is 20 million. The whole Stockholm is 1 million. We have 260 million people. So we have, we need more, you know, entrepreneurs to, to, to mobilize it, you know, to just to, to encourage the growth. So, like you said, if you put it in the hands of the government, like you said, they have the, an agenda, they have their own definition, and I think that's not going to be very effective if j we just say, oh, that's, that's the job of the government. And this is why people like you, people like me, people like, um, you know, some communities around, not only in Bali or around Indonesia, trying with some programs, trying with some, you know, um, curriculum, just to set up something. For me, selfishly, <coughs> why do I work so hard? Why do we work so hard to, in, to, to build the ecosystem? I run a co-working space. We support a lot of values. We are business with values, but make no mistake, we are a business. So, I can't harvest enough entrepreneurs yet in Bali. So let we step back and start planting seeds now. And this is why we work hard with a lot of people with the value of co-working, you know, collaboration, sharing economy, not doing everything by yourself. <laughs> to, to build this ecosystem, so then maybe in five years, maybe in three years, business is growing. Because then now, for example, I can like pick and choose from 100 entrepreneurs, and then maybe next year we have 1,000. So, so tell us a bit about the thousand startup digital program because that sounds like something that the government wanted to get going, and then you figured out ways to be able to do it without taking all their money and so on. Do you want to just share how what what the dynamics of that is and what you think will happen with that program over the next five years or so? Yeah, this one thousand digital startup, but then in Indonesian you call it startup digital, yeah. Um, it's actually initiated not by the government. It's initiated by Kibar. It's a, a tech ecosystem builder. It's a company in Jakarta. But they started planting ideas around maybe since 2015. And in 2016, in February 2016, our president went to Silicon Valley and see, you know, how digital economy can actually, how much money it can bring to the country, um, how much value it has, and they say like, oh, we can do this, you know. So the tagline now is that Indonesia wants to be the di digital energy of Southeast Asia by 2020. And many people, including myself, think we can actually do that. Again, 
what is uh, who is the biggest country in Southeast Asia? We are by far, by a long way. Yeah, yeah. and so far we are just mostly being treated as market. So we are like the the, the highest number of like Facebook user and Twitter user, and we can even set this trend of hashtag Om Telolet Om internationally just because Indonesians are very into it, you know. So we want to encourage a lot of young Indonesian people to be the player. Don't just be the audience. Don't just be the market. You can be the player. And can you imagine how, s how powerful that is if some Indonesians start moving? So you do that through education programs, like running, like r like running here in Bali mm. uh, for, for at, at student level or for even people in employment or people wanting to start their own business? So everybody can apply, but of course we, we target young people. So let's say between 20, uh, like maybe 18 to 25, um, just because you have less commitment, you want to try new things, you have a lot of ideas and you still need mentorship, you know? So this 1,000 um, uh, startup digital, digital startup, um, initiated by Kibar, but now supported by the Ministry of ICT. Um, and then we run it directly in 10 cities, and then Pasar is one of them. The whole thing will run for five years. And in one year, we will have two cycles, um, so per batch. And one batch is six months three months pre-incubation uh, period, you know, series of events, and another three months incubation period. So in the, the, the first three months, this um, uh, series of events, it started actually last Saturday. We started it with ignition, we say. It's like a half day seminar. We bring in like the CEO of Ticket.com, CEO of Female Daily, the VP of Garuda, you know, because then we there's like one panel talking about the future of travel, the tech travel and fintech and everything, you know. This is just to inspire people, just to put the mindset, you know, this, all these successful startups, when they just started, why did you start it? What was your journey? Are you successful just like this? What did it take for you to be here? You know, just like that. So we gathered like um, ignition phase. We needed to recruit 400 people. You can come as individuals or you can bring your team. And then after that, you moved to workshop. And people say that, oh, we select them. No, it's self-selection. If you want it, you come again. If you don't want it, it's self-selection. Self so normally, from these 400, we will get 200. Half will be gone. In, in workshop, is two days. Um, they will learn uh, from mentors about market validation, business model, design thinking, you know, all of those stuff. Um, and then after that, the next phase is hack sprint. It's actually hackathon, but then it's, it's just like a weekend, you know, two, three days. Um, you already form a team, you already found um, your co-founders from before, and then you're prototyping your ideas. So there will be judges, there will be programmers, um, high level ones, so CTO of this and CTO of that, you know. Um, and then after that, after hack sprint, we will move to bootcamp. And bootcamp is three days. And then our hack sprint, we will only have 100. And in boot by, by the time we have bootcamp, it's only 50. So from 400 to 50. And in bootcamp, it's three days um, period. And you have 50 participants, but maybe you can have 10 mentors. So they're really drilling you with, you know, their, their, their specific skills. You pitch, you really justify your business ideas, and then the startups who pass bootcamp will go to incubation. Mm. Okay. Um, we, and so that whole process is, is quite similar to some of the uh, incubator programs yes. in the U.S. and so on. Um, so, uh, so my next question is about the cross-pollination between between the international entrepreneurs. So like Chile had their whole, um, you know, like 
like the, the whole program to bring people in where they gave visas to entrepreneurs. They could all come in. And then they, the only thing is you had to stay there for like a year, but you could get grants and all the rest of it. And it, it created the whole ecosystem. Uh, you know, you, you've written about the, the challenge of in Indonesia, Indonesians like really getting the co-working idea, whereas overseas everyone gets it. And here in Bali, I, I think most of the co-working spaces at the moment have been started up. Uh, the ones that, that are quite well known have been started up by expats or people coming overseas coming in like Hubud or Outpost or even this place. Um, you've started up um, you know, Kumpo and you've seen just how, how the challenge of having Indonesian entrepreneurs connecting up with expat entrepreneurs. To what extent do you see that as being like a, there has to be some way to make that happen or a way to, uh, to nurture that in order for there to be more entrepreneurial spirit within um, Bali or even Indonesia? What's your thoughts around that? Um. Kumpul actually has 50-50. Sometimes you have 70% of Indonesian, and then um, sometimes 50, you know. We try to make a balance. And I think it's very important for, for two communities to access each other, because I think we tend to be stuck in our own bubble. Um, it's not that we don't want to meet the other network, you know. It's just a bit difficult. You're just stuck, you know. Um, but then I think it's, it's the responsibility of the co-working operators just to see this um, and, and to do something strategically about it. Like you said, it's actually a big value if people can share skills, you know, exchange pers uh, different perspectives in terms, in terms of uh, ideas or collaboration, right? Um, and I just, I, I want to encourage that you're talking about the startup visa. As you see, the immigration in our country, it's like its own country, you know? <laughs> so that's, that's a long fight. Yeah. Um, but then meanwhile, I think what we call the digital nomads or people who just want to come here for like a short period of time. And when I talk to a lot of digital nomads, many people want to be connected to local community. Many people want to, to give you know, to, to share skills. But then um, in co-working spaces, the type of what they call, like, let's say, the co-giving programs or whatever, it's not really channeling that. Co-working spaces or co-working business, we are not an EO. We are not internet cafe for hipsters. What is that co in, for, in front of that co-working? I always ask Indonesian, what is the English word for tempat kerja? Working place. It's working space, right? So why do you need to put the co? Is it just working space with coffee? The co actually symbolizes community that enables connections, that enables you to do collaboration. So, and there's always the economy factor in it. We need to push the economy. So as a co-working operator, the co-giving programs, I think, this is just my two cents, should be related to that. All of the di digital nomads, the location independent, are very highly skilled people. You can support yourself traveling around the world, getting money for it, you know? So, why are you cleaning the beach with you two bare hands? Why are you patting the orphans? Isn't it be more like, I don't know, I just think it will be more useful if you help, for example, a local startup um, figuring out their marketing strategy, figuring out their finance system, figuring out how to crowdfund. So more towards skilled volunteering and more towards businesses, local businesses. And that way you can actually connect to the to local community. And that way you can claim that you support the growth of economic development. So with, um, with both the, the 1,000 uh, digital startups and also with the co-working Indonesia, mm. which largely is supporting the local Indonesian entrepreneurs, uh, for everyone here, is there any programs, whether it's apprentice programs or whether it's uh, speaking, at, is there anything here 
that everyone here should know about that they could get involved in or that you've got planned coming up that allows them to do that exactly that kind of support you're talking about to help local entrepreneurs? I think in the future it's possible. This program was just launched last year. And then we, I think people really wanted to be Indonesian. People really wanted to be that they, they, they take charge of it, you know? So now it's very nationalistic. Everybody's Indonesians. Also, we want to push forward the, the, the local heroes, what we call the local heroes, you know? So Bali has their own local startups and we push them as speakers, we will promote them, you know, just to give some aspiration. It's like, oh, he can do it, she can do it. I can do it too. So it's not that we don't want help. I think when it's like mentoring programs and this and that, and then if you meet them in the co-working space, we will always link them with whoever has the skills that they need, you know. But then in the, in the formal program, I think we want it to be for Indonesian to give back to also Indonesians, at least now. OK. Um. Do, well, definitely, that's something we, I mean, it's all about collaboration. So I, I think we're all going to find ways to do that more and more. Yeah. Um, uh, there might be other questions that you have around the conversation we're having, and you're going to have a chance to ask questions in a moment. I have two more questions, which is coming more down um, to uh, the personal side and also coming down to just the fact that it's the International Women's Day. So my first question is, you said that a lot of Indonesians don't really get uh, giving, right? Or at least the whole concept of charity and so on in general, um, but you're Indonesian and you started off with UNICEF, Doctors Without the Borders, going to Zimbabwe, going to like Yemen. And what do you think it was that made you take that approach if it was kind of an outlier approach? I don't know. <laughs> no, I think, <laughs> I don't know. I'm weird, it's just like, you know, when, when I go to Pakistan, for example, they, they know there was like a Indonesian uh, staff also before me. So then she said, oh, you know, this, it's the one who, who replaced me. I was actually, my, my field was actually in psychology. So I was dealing with uh, trauma counseling and mental health projects at that time. So that's why I was traveling to all these difficult places. So she said like, oh, the one who replaced me is also Indonesian. So they expected someone like her because she's, like um, Malay looking, you know, with hijab, and, and then I, and then like, oh yeah, what's her name? Faye, at that time, like Faye Scarlett. My name is Faye Scarlett. Alun is my, my husband's uh, name, last name. It's like, but the name is very bule, you know, like, it's very foreign. So it's like, and then I come and I look Chinese, so. <laughs> <laughs> so. I don't know, I, I think my, my mom was always volunteering. So I think it, it takes a lot from that and you know how, how your family values one thing mm -hmm. and not yeah. the other. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, this is kind of like a mini question, it's not my other question, but uh, you said you studied psychology. Yeah, I think you did a master's in like conflict as well, right? H how do you think, like looking back now, those kind of things you learned are helping you now working with entrepreneurs? <coughs> Um, I think sometimes when you start something, you have a just different perspective of looking at things because like I said, co-working is a business and then now we say we have all of these programs. I deal a lot with, um, you know, people running businesses, um, st uh, startup founders, and everybody has like all this big business uh, background. Um, but then sometimes if you have just like a pr perspective of community development, how to make it sustainable, how actually you can be connected to, to, you know, just to bridge this group and that group, I think that helps. Um, uh, another initiative um, we, we started actually last August was a, a national association of co-working players uh, across Indonesia called Co-working Indonesia. Currently, I think um, if you count the one initiated also by governments and state-owned companies, uh, we have more than 100 spaces across Indonesia. So some key players got together. Uh, we have now probably around 25 people in the core team um, spread out in 10, eight cities uh, and then really work on how we can make co-working in Indonesia um, how you say, like, sustainable. 
relate more to the culture because co-working is actually a Western concept. And if we want to, to, to tap into the local community, to people, to Indonesian people, we have different culture, we have different characteristics. We have probably programs or projects or events working uh, for, for a co-working space in Australia will not work here. Uh, yeah, on, on that whole co-working side, I think um, that's definitely an ongoing conversation. I think every chance within the next year or two, that number you just mentioned is going to double or triple. Yeah. It's just things moving so quickly. Um, which brings me to my last question. So anyone who's got questions, have a think about it because we're going to open this up to you in a moment, which is about International Women's Day. Uh, there's a report which is really pretty much the only report, and I know statistics are statistics, but this is from Grant Thornton on the state of women leadership in business around the world. And they actually rank Indonesia sixth out of 192 countries. So number one, believe it or not, is Russia with 45% of all senior business, business leadership roles is uh, women in Russia. And then it's Lithuania, it's uh, um, Estonia, Philippines, Thailand, and then Indonesia. And apparently, and you know, you, you might dispute this, but apparently 36% of all senior leadership positions are held by women in Indonesia, ac according to the study. Um, imagine that's true or half true, right? That that actually is the number. And as you mentioned, there's a lot of people in Indonesia. In fact, Indonesia is like the fourth largest country in the world after America and uh, um, China and India. Uh, and is way above any of those three in terms of the percentage of women leaders, which means you could actually say it's actually the leading country in the world, size-wise, yeah. uh, in women leadership. Um, first of all, does that feel right to you when you actually uh, travel around and meet up with others? Uh, does it feel like it's higher than when you're uh, in other countries? And, and if it is, what do you think is the reason that Indonesia has managed that? Um, when I worked and lived in Yemen and uh, Pakistan, I felt lucky that I, I'm from Indonesia. Because I think in Indonesia, in all this gender in inequality, whatever, um, there's never a question who you send to school in our family. The first one goes to school. You don't have enough money for the second one, you know? Second one is a boy. But in most countries, that's the choice, right? You will just send the boy. So um, I don't know if you know, we, we have like a, a heroine uh, back in the Dutch days <laughs> called Kartini. And then she, she really like, I don't know how much actually she did, but she became a symbol of um, women that you need to get education and all this. Um, I mentioned that we have 25 people in the core team of co-working Indonesia. From these 25 people, it's only four women. From these four women, three are, are in top position. One as advisor, one is the president, which is me, and another one is the secretary general, which, which is my right hand, which is like the second, you know, like a layer. So three top positions are like run by women, and the boys are below. <laughs> so maybe it has something to do with the, maybe it has something to do with as you mentioned the um, uh, the history that there's like Probably, presidents, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, I th I think about it a lot, right? Because like being here, I think a lot of people come to Bali, and you you just get a sense there's this yin energy to the place, which is very different from the whole everyone's competing with each other. And the Banjar model in Bali, which I know is not the same all over Indonesia, but it's definitely very much a family model as well, which really is what co-working is. It's a family of people that are looking after for each other, which is very much that kind of an energy as well, which is very matriarchal. Mm. Um, I'm, I don't know, but it's kind of interesting how that's evolving. And I think it's an interesting conversation that as well as us being here saying, could Indonesia be, for Southeast Asia, the leader in entrepreneurship? It's also, could it be the leader, or already is the leader, but could it actually claim its space as the leader of women leadership and diversity as well, uh, which would be super exciting for a Muslim nation to actually take that lead globally in terms of diversity and not just um, you know gender, but also in terms of religions and everything else. We had female president, US no. They tried, they tried, yeah. Um, actually, when I go to meetings, it's still a lot of men 
You know, I, I find myself quite a lot that uh, I'm the only woman in 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 the room. So I mean, it's it's not that equal too, you know. Yeah. But I mean, we are still fighting for equality. Um, but I think there are a lot of initiatives. Like um, I think Google initiated it last year with female deaf, and this year they're going to start again. It's actually encouraging. Um, women to be leaders in um, IT and businesses, so they they want to shift it into startups. Actually, women as startup founders. Mm. So we're going to open this up for Q and A. Uh, I'd like you before we just get straight into. I know some of you got questions already, but I'd like everyone to be thinking just from what you heard. If you had a question, what would it be? So take a moment, turn to someone you might know them or not. It doesn't matter. Introduce yourself if you don't. Uh, and take a minute and think, well, here's what I got out of that, and here's a question if I had one, and just see what comes up, and then we'll take a few questions straight after that. All right. So who would like to ask a first question? I saw Demir had his hand up straight away, so let's come over to Demir. We don't have to give everyone a round of applause, but to kick it off, can we give Demir a round of applause for asking the first question? Uh, hey, Faye, great, great talk. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about, um, you talked about Western sort of values or conceptions. I don't know how you put it, but sort of, uh, ideas and phrases and, 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 and bridging that gap between how you know people in the Western world think and how startup culture, which is essentially Western in, in its origins, thinks, and how people who are trying to break into a startup culture think. And as a by way of like sh really short anecdote, we went to Spain, northern Spain, to, um, and my wife and I, we educate people in how to work. That's what we do. We teach people how to work the most effectively they can. So we're teaching a bunch of Spanish kids how to work, how to work with Western companies. And we came, we came up to a word which is called grit. Are you familiar with grit? Determination, perseverance, right? Grit is a distinctly American word. We spent an hour trying to explain what grit was. There really just wasn't a word for it. Like we had to combine a bunch of local words to come to the concept of grit. And that's the last time. I mean, we really, we stuck in with eight weeks with these kids. We really tried language barrier. We really moved through it. Uh, I can't say that it was a success. I, I really can't look you in the eye and say, yeah, we broke through and we got it. I, I feel like we, we both made a valiant effort to try to bridge that gap. And I, I would honestly say that I think we failed more than we succeeded um, in spite of really best efforts on both sides. So having been on the losing side of a, of a well-intentioned battle to bridge the gap, I wonder you know, what your perspective is on what it takes and how long it will take to sort of match ideas that are, you know, ideas and thoughts locally in language even to start up language and ideas and thoughts. When I traveled around, um, you are always be like someone from outside, right? And you have all of these ideas, you know, what's, what you think is right, what you think is good. Um, and like you said, you know, sometimes it worked in certain places, certain culture, sometimes it didn't. Um, and I think being now in Indonesia, okay, I'm Indonesian, so I understand a little bit, but I lived abroad too. I studied abroad too, you know, so maybe I also understand that. So maybe just that understanding is already like it's enough to, to bridge. I don't know, I, I can't really pinpoint my finger like the formula and what that is, you know, what skill, what knowledge. But it's just like the things you do. Every time you want to do something, every time you want to do an event, for example, every time you want to invite people, the way you invite people, the way you create strategies, I think th that counts, you know, that um, knowledge. Um, so I think as a, like a startup, for example, if you want to, to scale up to just to, to branch out to another country, and then you have to work with the culture around it, the market around it, you know. It's very important to involve someone um, from the area. Just to take in how, you know, just to learn. So not just like come and invade. Because maybe sometimes it doesn't work. I, I think what you're saying is so important that you have to have the local reference points you know, in this last year, we've gone from no unicorns, no billionaire, million dollar businesses in, in Indonesia to three, right? Um, Gojek, T Traveloka, and, uh, and Tokopedia, right? And, um, and then suddenly it's like, from people who say, well, it's not possible, to suddenly it's like, oh, it's actually happening. 
and actually if I don't do something then I might actually miss out on the next thing and and so nurturing those success stories um, means you don't really need to teach what it is you just go oh this is possible and then those who don't believe it won't do it and those who do believe it will then say right well that means I can follow in that path as well which sounds a lot like what you're doing as well getting those success stories and then getting those people to share with each other um, and I think the more we're all doing that we're actually supporting and helping local entrepreneurs to then actually become success stories too that then creates a, a, a rise in the tide yeah. um, I think maybe I'm biased but then just by working in a local co-working space <laughs> that helps Let's take another question. Who else has a question you'd like to ask? Yes, sorry, we got the microphone. Dee's got it there. Oh, oh, sorry, uh, Dee's already <laughs> ahead of me. Okay, Dee's gonna decide. I'm closer to the microphone, so I win. Um, I'm really interested in what you were saying about... Um, sorry, you just before you go further, oh, could yeah. you just... Yeah. I'm Ryan. Uh, I actually have been in the co-working industry for like almost four years now, so um, first, uh, it was really great to hear you talk, and I really love your perspective on social impact and economic development, as well as it intersects with co-working. Um, and it's something that's been on my mind a lot lately. So, um, sex with co-working <coughs> inter intersects. Oh, well, I haven't thought about that one yet. That was you said it. You said it, not me. Um, I'm really interested in your perspective uh, and in what you said about um, using the skill, the skills of digital nomads, um, and, and you know, utilizing these people who have all of these uh, who have a lot of training and knowledge uh, for local economic development and giving back versus obviously like you said I, I uh, thought it was funny about the why are we all why are we picking up trash on the beach because it's true and, and I think this doesn't just happen in places like here it happens all over the world um, I'm curious if you guys have tried any if you have any programs going on at Kumpool and and or if you've seen any other interesting programs at co-working spaces that really are utilizing uh, the the really valuable skills of people to to give back or or create opportunities for the local community for us, we just do it uh, within the space with like skill sharing sessions. Um, I think because in the in in Kumpul we have a little bit like uh, a balance, you know, like a fifty fifty. Um, I think y we need to try harder if the members of the co-working is already just from one group. When it becomes too, just what you call it, homogen, like it's 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 yeah yeah homogeneous. So, because then that will, um, when I, when maybe when you come to a, a place and then you see everybody else is different from you, you don't feel at ease, you don't feel this is your place, you don't feel belong. So it's, I think, as a co-working space, it's very um, important to just to create like a lot of communities in it, you know, to make sure they blend. Because as soon as it blends, actually it's easier to do that without having to have like a structured program. But as soon as you have just one, one type of uh, people, one type of group, then you have to work harder to make sure there's a structure, there's a program for people to, to reach out. Because otherwise, then if you just let, let them be, everybody will just be in there, stuck in their own bubble again. I do want to share one thing, just because um, I didn't have a chance to share this with you earlier, Faye, but in the next six months, we're launching with his Entre Entrepreneurs Institute an Entrepreneur Apprentice Program. Uh, and the way the Entrepreneur Apprentice Program is different from um, an intern where y someone takes on uh, an intern and then they're in charge of training up this person. Uh, we've kind of created a three-way uh, connection between the experts that are creating micro degrees. So it might be on how to set up a website or it might be on doing an app or even things like sales skills or so on. Um, and they then can, anyone can actually, as an apprentice, join that. Uh, then you've got the mentors who actually choose to take someone on for a year. So it could take on a local entrepreneur. Uh, and that local entrepreneur then does these micro degrees and applies them in the business to set up a store, or set whatever it happens to be. And it's all facilitated online and global. But we're doing it with you know, all the co working spaces we're partnering with as well. So, I, and I know there's another other, other programs like that that are just starting. But I think we are at that point and a very exciting point in the next couple of years where there's uh, enough co-working spaces in critical mass now that people are now asking that next question, which is not how do I just get my co-working place started, but how do I now interconnect with others to make a global difference, which is great. Andre. Hey, my name is Andrew. Uh, yeah, great, uh, great speech. Uh, <laughs> just a question, when you was a young girl, what, what, what was your biggest dream? And do you still live that dream? 
My mom is a psychologist. My dad is an architect. So I'm not, um, an, just from that perspective, I'm not a normal Chinese Indonesian you know, family because we don't do tradings. We, we can't speak any Mandarin or Chinese. We're so Indonesian because I think we're just old generation of Chinese. So we're just like professionals, you know. You, s you, you go to good schools, you become a professional, you get a good job, and, and that's what that is, you know. Yeah, but Actually I think every family, child is ev dreaming. And my, but so my, my dream was when I was little, I wanted to become like my father. I wanted to be an architect, but then I couldn't draw, apparently. <laughs> so <laughs> growing up, I like to talk, <laughs> as you can tell. Um, I think that's like my skill, <laughs> only, <laughs> my only skill. And then um, I like social sciences, you know. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to take psychology. And I think being 15, being 18, uh, and especially in Indonesia at that time, uh, you didn't have that much, uh, that many choices, you know. You don't have this degree in um, whatever. Um, uh, you know, even if you want to, to become a chiropractor, you, you can't, you know, in Indonesia. There's just like so, so limited degrees. And at that time, I thought, okay, at least in psychology, you know, when I, I'm getting older, I still can get a job. Because then, you know, people respect old psychologists. <laughs> I actually struggled when I was just like 24, 25. And then um, doing counseling session for like old men, you know, in Pakistan, and they go like, "Have you finished school?" <laughs> so actually, it was, you know, I I don't know, like my dream was just, yeah, I think I, I wanted to be like my dad when I was little, and then I be just, and then I turned out to be like my mom. And now you live your own dream. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Who, who else would like to ask a question? Actually, I have a question. Go for it, um, So you know that Roger developed this wealth dynamic profiling tool for uh, you to discover what type of entrepreneur you are. So probably you're a star if you are um, you like to speak and you are a people person. And um, for a star, it's very hard because uh, you uh, give a lot of energy to, to people, but you also have family, you have business, and you have um, communities. So how do you balance your uh, life between these, um, 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 these um, like pillars of your life? Uh, and you look so awesome. Um, so we need, we need to know the secret. Um. The secret is having the right partner, I think. So I always attribute it to a partner. You can't do everything, anything, everything alone. So again, like co-working values, you know, you need to collaborate, you need to delegate. Um, I can speak in front of public, but most of the thoughts and most of the concept we, we do together with Dennis, you know, my husband. So, um, like you said, um, I give a lot of energy, but being an extrovert, I also get a lot of energy from social interaction. So for example, my, my husband is an introvert, so he is a social introvert, you know? So he likes to, to talk with people, he likes to have meaningful conversations, but then it drains him. So his way of recharging is just to be like, just give me some me time, you know? I just need to be alone with my codes, he's a programmer. You know, like a, a geek, like let me just be like geeking out a little bit and then I'll be fine. And for me, if, you know, a like co-working space, sometimes it's so full, sometimes it's empty. When it's empty, I got depressed. And I actually get out, we are very lucky, we are actually located in a creative hub. So we are the, not the only place there, we are not the only building, you know. So I could actually go down, so we are on the second floor, I could actually go down to the coffee shop, talk to the, like, where is the owner, you know, like, it's like, we are friends. And start talking, you know, uh, for half an hour, and that's my way of, re like, recharging my bat batteries, actually. So, um, I got two kids, three and a half and five years old, um, and with Kumpul. <laughs> So it's like having three toddlers below five. 
And I think this is why I lost weight. <laughs> no, I think I, I told you just like in between. Mm. Why do you do so much? It's, I didn't mean it, you know. I just like, you see something, you just do something about it. And then along the way, you just set your priorities. Because now, if you want to, to see me, I, I run Kumpo. But then I said, okay, I, I run also all the other things. So Dennis is actually taking care of the internal communities. So the operation, the internal communities, and, you know, talking to members, which he likes. And then I take care more of this 1,000 startup, this co-working Indonesia, this GBG. So I also run Google Business Group in Bali. Um, so all of this, you know. So um, I don't know. We, we see. <laughs> well, I think you're answering it already. Like when you're in your flow and you're doing the things you love to do and you're getting charged up with the things that you actually... This all comes back down to self-awareness. You just over yeah. time got really clear about what you like, what you don't like, what drives you. And then you're following that through yeah. as well, which is awesome. We've got time for one more question. Right over here. Uh, my name is Lisette, so thank you very much. I learned a lot. I was just wondering if, as a woman, as you've mentioned, you've, yeah, sometimes you feel like you're the only woman in the entire room. Do you ever get discriminated for being a woman? No, I don't think so. I just spoke to a co-working founder. Um, I mean, with like she just set up like a new co-working, and then she told me, sometimes I feel a little bit, you know, intimidated if I am in the in the room and then it's like full of men. I was like, huh, I never really feel like that, you know. And if you see me, I'm very small. I'm very short. I think I stopped growing when I was 12. So I was pretty tall when I was 12 in the class, and then after that, I stopped growing. So. I'm short, I look Chinese, and you know, I mean, if I'm in this room with like Indonesians, no, they don't look like this. Um, I don't know, I think I just come and then I just say what I think it is. And um, Indonesians, I think, is pretty good. I mean, they don't discriminate a lot. I don't know, we have two Indonesian guys there. <laughs> we can ask them. <laughs> what, what do you think if you are like in the meeting and suddenly there's like this small woman telling you to do stuff, you know? <laughs> Maybe they like it. Maybe they need their directions in life, so. <laughs> I think out of, out of personal experience, I grew up here and, oh uh, yeah. Out of, yeah, I'm Maxim by the way. Um, yeah, out of personal experience, I grew up here in Indonesia and I can say my parents work together and often my mom was treated as the bigger boss. Um, often Indonesian people are more scared of the woman than the man. <laughs> yeah, it's often surprising, but that's yeah, kind of how it is here. <laughs> so uh, so just, just to wrap this up, I just want to tell a quick story of uh, which this, this conversation reminds me of. Um, and I'll explain why. Uh, I was, uh, I just finished my university and I was going back to see my mom and dad who were at that time in Hong Kong. Um, and we turned on the TV. Uh, we turned on the TV, and my my mom and dad met each other as police man and woman uh, in the Hong Kong police. Right can you like speak louder, please? Sorry, we people here they don't they don't really hear you. Oh, can you but hear me this now? is why you, s you should you should have said. Yeah, that. definitely. There's loads of really awesome seats right here. Can you hear me now? Is that okay? So uh, what I um, what I was saying was that I was sitting there just watching the news, and my dad was there, and th they'd met like maybe 30, 40 years earlier in the Hong Kong police at the very beginning of Hong Kong. When we were just getting started, and uh, so watching the news, and you know the chief of police comes on, and he goes, "Oh, I know him, right? That's, that's such and such, right?" And I was like, "Oh, wow, personally, yeah, yeah, we're good friends." Oh, okay. The next person that comes on is like, you know, the person who's in the head of the Supreme Court, right? And he's like, "Oh, I know that person." It's like, and then and then like every single person on the news, he's like, "Oh, I know that person. I know that person." I'm like, "Dad, you're like really well connected. You know all these people," and he goes, "No, not really. It's just that, you know, if you're there at the beginning of something, 30 years later." when everyone's actually now running the entire country or running everything, you, of course you're gonna know them because you just stuck around, right? Yeah. And uh, that really stuck with me, that idea, wow, maybe one day I'll be at the beginning of something and then 30 years later, we'll look back and we'll go, wow, we were at that point and now look at us all and what we're doing, right? So the reason I share that story is I really feel everything you're talking about, like, you know, the, the whole internet, the whole internet co-working started six months ago, right? Or less, it was in August, something like that. The, the, the thousand digital startups happened this month. It was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, started mid-2016 in Jakarta, but yeah. then for Denpasar last week. Last week, right? So, so all these things are happening right now. 
I'm sure all of you here, the, you know, the co-working spaces you, you go to here in uh, Bali didn't even exist, you know, five years ago. So, so we actually all are at the very, very beginning of this entrepreneur movement here in Indonesia. And I'm really excited to see in the next 10 years, I know you're going to end up in amazing places doing amazing things. And I know it's going to be the same for many of us here as well. And I just like really uh, encourage everyone to just think that this is not just a talk coming down and having a chat like at the beginning of a March 2017, but it's actually, you know, a, a kind of like a, a moment when you're hearing about all these initiatives and all these views about Indonesia potentially being a leader for entrepreneurship, being a leader for women leadership, where we're at that beginning point. Uh, and there's no reason why it wouldn't all happen as long as we all just put our bid in as well. So given that it is International Women's Day uh, and given that what it is in many of our views to be a woman leader uh, is to really stand for our truth uh, and then live it and create that ripple effect from it, uh, I think there's uh, no uh, better way to spend it than to have had a chance to have a conversation with you here tonight. Thank you. So I want to say a really huge big thank you and please give a big round of applause to the most amazing speaker. I want to say thank you very much for actually being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah.